I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Richard Silberstein, a professor of neuroscience at the Brain Sciences Institute of Swinburne University, where he served as founding director and previously as the head of the Department of Physics. Dr. Silberstein has a long-standing interest in functional brain imaging and is the inventor of steady-state topography, a technique for rapid mapping of brain changes in human brain activity. Steady-state topography has been used to investigate normal cognitive and emotional processes, such as short-term memory, visual imagery, and anxiety, as well as disordered brain states, such as schizophrenia and attention deficit disorder. More recently, Professor Silberstein has used an SST variant to investigate the relationship between cognitive ability, including creativity and brain functional connectivity. Dr. Silberstein has a PhD in neuroscience from the University of Melbourne, and in addition to his professorial duties, he also serves as the chairman and CEO of NeuroInsight, a company offering SST-based brain imaging consulting services to the communication services industry. So Richard, welcome. It is a pleasure and an honor to have you with me today, sir. Thank you, Tim, for the introduction. Oh, absolutely. So today we are discussing an exciting bio-archive preprint of a new paper entitled Brain Functional Connectivity Correlates of Anomalous Interaction Between Sensorially Isolated Monozygotic Twins. That is absolutely a mouthful. I'm going to drop a copy of, of the title and some info in the, the notes so that people can get that because there's no way that they will remember that title. So when they dig into this, I think they're going to be very excited about this topic, though. Can you give us a layperson's description of what this paper is about and what inspired your research into it? Okay. <clears throat> the paper is about a phenomenon that's frequently spoken about. And that's the notion that two people, or more, but generally two people who are, have a close emotional bond uh, sometimes report situations when they're even separated by, in some cases, very long distances. Something happens to one of them, generally an unpleasant thing, an accident or some sort of pain, etc. And the other one will say, oh, I felt that. Uh, I, I just knew that it had happened, etc. And in fact, the whole field of EEG research arose because of just such an experience. In, in the First World War, um, a German medical officer, I'll just give his name as Hans at this stage, was uh, involved on the Western Front in France during that First World War. And he was involved in a near accident, which would have been fatal. He was almost run over by a horse-drawn gun carriage. He was only slightly injured and was sent to a field hospital. Within an hour or two, he received a telegram from his father in Berlin, some 700 kilometers away which said to the effect, Hans, are you well? Your sister had a dreadful feeling something awful had happened to you. Um, he responded, but that set him thinking, how on earth did my sister know that something had happened to me? Because it was precisely at that time. And he considered it to be some form of mental telepathy. And that sent him on his search for, well, what is generating a signal? He had a relatively simple approach. It must be something like a, a radio transmitter and a, and, a, and a receiver. What is it about radio waves? Well, they're generated by electricity. Let's look for electricity in the brain. That was Hans Berger who discovered the electroencephalogram in the 1920s. And it was that sort of experience that actually led him for the search. Now, there have been a number of studies that have looked at uh, this type of effect, where you, which, which is reported much more prominently in identical twins. Technical term, monozygotic. And I should just, on the side, explain. The, paper, the title and the paper is written in a typical academic, rather turgid style. Um, and um, what the paper is currently under review in a a, a well-regarded neuroscience journal, but if I'd like to get it published in a neuroscience journal, and as you as you understand, within the neuroscience community, 
Uh, this area is, shall we say, the subject of heated controversy. Um, and as a result, um, it's sometimes difficult to actually get things published in this area. So writing it in a traditional and, dare I say, turgid <laughs> academic style uh, probably makes it just that little bit easier for, for it to get through the hoops. So I was interested in going beyond just demonstrating whether this effect is real, because there have actually been quite a few experiments, and there's a huge body of research associated with this type of thing, so-called mental telepathy. There are a range of experiments using a type of sensory isolation where you have, you know, called the Gansfield technique, where you have a person in one room, another person, and you present them with an image and, you know, can they guess or can they sense what the image is? So these type of experiments have been around for a while, including the, those involved with um, uh, monozygotic or identical twins. In fact, there was a paper published in a very prestigious journal, Science, in 1965, which looked at identical twins and they measured their EEG in separate rooms. And when one closed his or her eyes, I don't know if they were male or female, um, the alpha activity changes in the brain, and that's well known. But what was interesting was the alpha activity in the other twin that had their eyes open also changed. Um, and that shouldn't have happened. So there have been a number of experiments. But what I wanted to do with this study is go beyond just demonstrating, hey, this stuff's real, because I think there's a huge amount of evidence that it is, to actually say, what's going on in the brain? What is the neural reflection of this? Because the fact that people can report things obviously means that it's affected the brain and it's led to a conscious experience. But I suspect we're probably much more sensitive and we probably have these sorts of um, interactions and influences which don't reach the level of consciousness. They're at the level of the unconscious. And so by looking at not just brain activity, but the way the brain talks to itself, the way it organizes itself through what's called functional connectivity. Different regions of the brain set up a communication by oscillating at the same frequency. And they do this dynamically, very fast. And the technology that, that we've developed enables us to track these rapid changes in what's called connectivity. So I was looking at what was actually happening in the brain during those phases. So a rather long-winded answer, Tim, but that's just the background and what led me to that. Ah, and it, this is absolutely wonderful. I want to back up a little bit and go over some of these parts. It, your answer was incredibly detailed. I think that we may have lost some of the audience in general. So I want to give a bit of background. Dr. Julia Mossbridge sent me your paper. And when I started reading through it, I realized it was a twin study. And I got really excited because in one form or another, twin studies date back several thousand years. And the idea of long distance telepathy or telepathic communication between twins is something that was very popular in the science fiction that I grew up with, right? Books like Robert Heinlein's Time for the Stars was one. Uh, Andre Norton's Quest Cross Time. I think I read that as a child. And when I went out looking the other night, I actually found a list of those online. It had literally dozens of novels, movies, TV shows, comic books, and other media that feature this very common theme, I guess, of twin telepathy. So this is something that is is well known. And during the 20th century, it was very popular in fiction. Now, as a scientist working in this area, uh, you've already kind of said that you think that there is substance to this idea, right? This perception that there is, I think everyone knows that twins have a very special connection but scientifically speaking, this is something that goes beyond just a conventional, easily explained connection, right? Yep, yep, exactly. Um, sure, identical twins have a very high degree of um, genetic similarity. Uh, we, we know that. There can be slight variations, mind you, but generally... And um, certainly if they grow up together... Um, there will be enormous similarity. They'll be able to finish each other's sentences and, and, and things like that. Those things are generally, in a sense, accepted within 
the broad neuroscience community as, yep, that's that, those are all real, real effects. What is, is more difficult to account for are the sorts of experiences that, you know, I mentioned with Hans Berger, kilometres away, you know, hundreds, thousands of kilometres away, people being aware of, of the... Now, these occur less frequently, uh, but um, there's been some scientific evidence to point that they, they are real. Now, it could well be that identical twins, one of zygotic twins, are simply the tip of the iceberg. In other words, this phenomenon may actually end up being much more common than we imagine. Mother and child, lovers, good friends, etc. I suspect that there are these sorts of uh, interactions taking place all the time below our level of consciousness. Now, why did we look at um, monozygotic twins? Because what we're after is not so much an experiment to prove that this stuff happens, because I think there's a lot of evidence that it does. The crucial thing was to see what is also happening in the brain. Uh, and using identical twins where this phenomenon is much more common, essentially tilted the odds in our in the favor of the effect showing itself. Because you can have met there are many monozygotic twins who say, there's absolutely no relationship. I've never felt anything like that, et cetera. So there is, there's a lot of variation. So that's the reason we selected um, monozygotic twins. But um, I, I think they are very much the tip of the iceberg in the sense of how often these things happen. Uh, so essentially, that was the purpose of it, to look, to look also at the brain, because I think there are wider implications as well, which we can go on depending on what your preference is. Oh, absolutely. Well, let me get into the experiment briefly. So you yep. mentioned in the paper, you'd written that there were five twin pairs. They served yep. twice as participants with an average interval between sessions, 67 days. So basically there were 10 people involved in the study, yep. five pairs of twins. Um, again, this ran for quite a period of time. In each recording session, one twin functioned as a sender viewing a randomized set of 50 general images and 50 personally relevant images, while the other twin functioned as a receiver viewing a static personally relevant image for the entire duration of the session. So the images were presented for one second between successive images, and there was a, a variation, a random variation between four and eight seconds uh, of, of successive images. So I, I want to break this down a little bit. Basically you were displaying images for one twin who functioned as a sender. You were measuring the brain activity of both during this and basically yeah. trying to pick up kind of correlation in the receiver. Is that kind of how it works? Yeah. Let, let me explain probably, um, slightly differently. Um, when you, present a new image on a screen to somebody, for example, just a, a, a picture, the brain responds. Certain parts of the brain talk to each other for a second or two. It's a very small effect. You know, it's hard to see. But if you repeat it over and over with different images, et cetera, and you average it, but you've got to average it on a fixed point in time, the exact point where the image starts, where the image is on the screen. So if you line up all those start points for where the image comes on the screen, and average and calculate the average connectivity, say, in the person looking at the images, you'll see these changes which represent how the brain is processing the images. Great. Now, that's the person looking at the changing images, the sender. What about her twin in the other room that's just looking at a blank screen, or essentially a fixed image, no change? There, there are no events there to synchronize anything. But what if you take the timing of the sender's images, when the sender sees them, and apply it to the brain activity of the receiver as if they were the ones also looking at the same images? Now, theoretically, you should get nothing because they're just looking at a static image. But what we found in, in some cases, quite strong, was that there are these characteristic changes that only occurred in the receiver when you synchronize with what the sender was saying. And they were in separate rooms, um, about eight meters apart, three closed doors behind them. There was no sound. Uh, there was no signaling. 
So that's essentially the essence. Now, there were altogether 100 images that a sender would look at. 50 of those were just images of scenery that we selected. And we also asked them to provide up to 50 images uh, that were personally relevant to the twins. Um, we thought maybe the personally relevant images would have a stronger effect than other ones. As it turned out, it depended on, on the twins. Sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't. So that's basically the, the gist of the experiment. Ah, uh, well, I also wanted to touch on the measuring apparatus. And again, yep, I, yep. I think this this goes to your area of specialization. So the paper discussed something called steady state visual yep. evoked potential event related partial coherence, SSVEP, <laughs> ERPC. Again, these are definitely a mouthful, but yeah, um, yeah. that was what was used to measure the connectivity between the twins. And that stands in contrast to other experiments that have been done in the past that used an EEG or uh, an fMRI to, to do imaging. Yeah, yeah. So can you explain that kind of briefly to us? What what makes sure, this different sure. the, the, than those? The, okay. The, the methodology, uh, generally, if you look at the brain's activity, um, at any time right now, your brain, my brain, it's producing electrical activity, and we just call that the EEG, the ongoing activity. There's also a version of it called an evoked response. In other words, uh, you know, I clap my hands, uh, a, an image comes up. There's a little response that occurs just due to that. So that's called an evoked response. What we're doing in, the, in this technology is we're mixing two kinds of um, uh, stimuli. One is the images that people look at on the screen. But at the same time, in the periphery, there's a flickering light that's flickering uh -huh. all the time at 13 cycles a second. And that's just in the periphery. It doesn't get in the way. It's dim. Um, now, what that flicker light does is it causes all the different parts of the brain to start to oscillate at the same frequency. Very, very. It's a very, very small signal, but you can just measure it. And essentially what happens is this. When a part of the brain becomes uh, more active, uh, that frequency, the, the oscillation, just goes up a little bit higher and, and lower. But what we also do is we look at how the oscillations in different parts of the brain are synchronized, because we know when they're synchronized, those parts of the brain are talking to each other. And that's what I mean by brain functional connectivity, this sort of communication between regions. So what this methodology does is it gives you uh, an insight into rapid changes in brain connectivity associated with what people are seeing on the screen. Now, th there's a way of measuring something analogous to that with fMRI. I don't know if you want me to mention the differences or not, but I I'm, I'm happy to, um, depending on... Well, it's it's completely it's completely up to you. It's completely up to you. You're oh, okay. you're getting well, in on a, a level of depth that is definitely beyond my my knowledge. But you know, I, I would say yeah. go for it if if that. Oh, look, just very, very briefly, uh, what typically happens when people measure brain connectivity? Because this is the way the brain communicates through these networks. This is really where the game is. You know, we used to think, oh, there's a part of the brain that does something. There's a hot spot there. Then there's a hot spot there. No. The brain doesn't work on hotspots. It works as networks. Basically, regions light up, they communicate, they do what they need to do, then they stop. Um, and you can measure the communication by essentially how similar the, the activity is, how correlated the activity is. Now, when you're sitting in an fMRI camera and you're just relaxing, um, Different parts of the brain are still active. They're always active. You're daydreaming. You're thinking about the next interview. What are you going to do on the weekend, et cetera, et cetera, all those sorts of things. And you can measure those variations in brain activity, and you can measure which parts of the brain preferentially talk to each other. The problem with fMRI and, and you know the usual imaging is it doesn't measure brain activity. It measures changes in brain blood flow uh, during thinking. But, you know, the brain, like any organ in the body, if it becomes more active, there's more blood flow. Yeah. So you're measuring the blood flow change. And these are very slow by comparison with what the brain is really doing in terms of electrical activity. So that's why we've selected our methodology, the evoked potential coherence, because it gives us an insight into these rapid changes. Because in the case of the twin telepathy stuff, some of the changes, for example, occurred in 
less than a second. You wouldn't have seen those with fMRI, and yet we're we're seeing them. So uh, I'm I must admit um, I'm rather excited about uh, the finding. Most of my research work up till now has been in in basically uh, cognitive neuroscience, um, and we've been developing this technology. And so this is the first time we've applied it in this new domain. Well. In terms of the results of this, you now you did find statistically significant uh, deviations yeah. from the norm. I guess. Uh, can you describe what the results were and how sure. how did that deviate from like what you might describe as kind of a mean? I guess. Okay. Okay. Well, what you're what you're doing is you're sort of saying, okay, let's we are assuming that um, if we get an effect in the in the receiver. It's because the specific we're using the timing of when the pictures came up for the sender. Uh, because if I get changes in connectivity with timing, someone could say, oh, look, that's just a fluke. That could have just happened by accident, etc." Now, it's all very well for me to say, no, no, it only happens because we're using the correct, just the correct timing. So what you do in statistics, you say, all right, let's take them at their word. Let's assume it is a fluke. Let's generate 100 random times. You know, and let's calculate the, the connectivity for that. You do that 10,000 times. Then you sort of say, well, okay, let's have a look at the result we actually got compared to what we got, we would have got just by random. And that gives you an idea of what are the chances that the result you got was a fluke, was just an accident. And essentially what, what the statistics shows is this, we found strong effects, particularly in the visual part of the brain, of the receiver, but the receiver is not looking at any changing images, and also the left temporal part of the brain, probably associated with memory processes. It could be evoking memories. But mind you, the receiver doesn't report any images. They don't say anything. So those are the regions of the brain that lit up uh, when we were looking at that. So you can then sort of say, well, uh, what's the probability of seeing, what are the chances that that was a fluke? In other words, the, the so-called p-value that scientists really push. And, and you want the chances of that being an accident, a fluke, as small as possible. You know, one in, you know, they say one in 20, the chance 5%, that's pretty lax, you know. So what we found is that, you know, we were getting results, the chances of individual findings within a person at, uh, you know, one, the chance of that happening by chance, one in a thousand, one in 500, that's that's pretty good. But we all together, we got 12, uh, sorry, 14 findings, individual findings um, out of the entire data that we got out of potentially 107, over 170 potential findings. And, the, and when we do the statistics, okay, what are the chances of getting that many strong positive results what are the chances of that happening just as a fluke and the chances are about roughly one in 20 million wow it's uh you know in other words you know you need to run that many that's what that's what the statistics say and i've taken a pretty conservative approach so what that says is hey the the effect looks real can i say absolutely there's you know i haven't screwed up anywhere to the best of my knowledge i don't think i have um but look the reality is this i this at this stage this is the this is a pilot study it's just come off we're really excited i'm pretty confident this stuff is real i will be even happier when we follow up with our next experiment where we can have people first of all any anywhere in the world not just in two or three rooms apart and we will have more electrodes. So we'll be actually able to look into the cortex more accurately, what's actually happening. Um, and now when when we get positive results there, which I think we will, that will make me even, even happier. But look, the bottom line is this, um, not just my view, but for other scientists, they really won't, they, they won't have total confidence until it's replicated independently and by other scientists. And that's something I'm keen to work with others, to cooperate with others, to sort of make the technology available so they can have a go at replicating it as well. I think that's that's the way science should be done. 
It's exciting. It's exciting. Yeah. And the results of this study seem to indicate that twins are, in fact, telepathic. But yeah. as you mentioned earlier, this goes beyond twins. Now, are you thinking about extending this study to include parent-child relationships and other close bonds, such as family members? Look, yes, yes, uh, certainly we we, uh, we will be, and, and I'd be very interested in the nature of those. But there's also a wider, if you will, not so much a philosophical issue, but a, a sort of a deeper issue. Of what is this sort of saying about, about the brain and, and consciousness and implications for things like mental health? Um, you know, the notion that these effects are, are, are real um, leads to the issue of, well, how is it, what's the nature of the brain? What's it actually doing? Is it like a, a very sensitive antenna picking up these effects, which are very weak? Or is it the other way around? Is the brain actually a filter? Are these effects really much stronger than we think? And the role of, of the brain is to filter them down so they don't overwhelm you. You know, if you're walking down the street and you're aware of ev what everybody was thinking telepathically, you couldn't function. Uh, you'd, just be, you'd just be overwhelmed. And so the notion is that this filter theory of, of the brain, in other words, it's actually there to reduce this effect. What if it goes wrong? What if some of the um, mental illnesses that we see, the psychoses, could be related to abnormalities in this filter process? And my the research I'd like to conduct is looking more closely at this filter because it could have implications for better ways without drugs, of, of treating some of the mental uh, disorders and particularly the psychoses. Um, but also it sort of goes more deeply into the, the very nature of consciousness itself. Yeah, again, incredibly exciting. Richard, let me thank you so much for your time today. This is a tremendous topic. And, you know, as your research progresses, I would love to have you back on to describe it more for the audience. I think that we have probably overwhelmed people for today. I definitely am going to put links in there so they can read and learn more about this. This is a, a big idea, and it seems to reinforce a lot of these I, concepts, I guess, about telepathy and some kind of possible entanglement. Let me yeah. close by asking what comes next for you and what comes next for this area of study? I think that you have mentioned uh, using additional electrodes and being able to use people in different locations around the world. Are those things that are coming up in the next year or two, do you it, think? Exactly, exactly. And, and one of the things that I'd like to sort of see, and this is a long shot, is can we use this approach to see if we can measure the speed of interaction? Uh, beyond these, you know, etc. Is it is it uh, slower than the speed of light? Is it possibly at or maybe even faster? We don't know because we know that quantum entanglement uh, is instantaneous, no matter how far apart. I'm not saying that what we're saying is quantum entanglement, but maybe there's something analogous there, and that's something I'd, I'd like to explore. And as I said, the other one is just understanding more about the brain itself and maybe ways of tapping greater levels of human potential, uh, as well as helping individuals, uh, you know, to address maybe medical conditions that are associated with disordered filter processes. Again, absolutely amazing. Thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I haven't lost too much of your audience. <laughs> See you.